Can you hear me? Oh, yes. All right. Well, welcome to class. Sorry for the delay. Um, I just want to welcome you all. We've got some um, guests with us this morning, some prospective students. I'd like to welcome you all here with us to Music History 2. This is a class where we are discussing uh, classicism today. Um, last term we looked at the Baroque period, Renaissance era, and then uh, this term we're looking at classicism, romanticism, and modernity in, um, in classical music. And today we are in our second week of studying the classical period, which is the late 18th century and the early 19th century. So um, just to review, we started with um, a discussion about what the values of that period are. Um, of course, this is the Enlightenment era. So during the Enlightenment, we've got a lot of um, focus on empiricism and um, structural conventions, which is the same thing about uh, this true about classicism. So um, let's pray. We'll get started and, um, and jump into today's lecture. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for bringing us all here safely. Um, Lord, I pray that you would keep us well from this coronavirus and that you would protect us and our loved ones from it as well. Um, Lord, I pray that you would bless our hour as we talk through music and help understand the aesthetics of this period and how wonderful this music is. pray that Christ would be glorified in all this done for his sake. Amen. All right, so I'd like to begin just reviewing from last week, and um, if you all just make sure your microphones are muted, and we will um, have a better experience. All right, so um, when we're talking about classicism, we are talking about a period of time that follows the Baroque period, where we have a Greek revival of values. So if you'll recall, we had six different um, topics that we talked about last week. We had the issue of clarity, simplicity, symmetry, balance, order, and objectivity. So these are the six primary um, object, objectives for the classical composers, which is also true for classical um, visual arts and for um, for literature. So these are the six six things we're talking about. We're going to see those reoccurring today as we're talking about instrumental music and it will probably be even more so than than we talked about with opera. So one of the other things that happens is we start seeing during the classical period more and more um, art music and that is that is music that exists for its own enjoyment and for the realization of the higher order. So in the Baroque period, most everything was for enjoyment. So like opera, music for um, for the different um, courtly courtly functions, but also we had the church music. So the church music was written for a specific occasion in the church life, and so. During the classical period, we're going to have more and more objective music, which has no connection to an event. So these symphonies, sonatas, string quartets are music for their own sake, really. So in addition to those six different um, characteristics like clarity, simplicity, and whatnot, we also have a revival of the rhetorical styles from the Greek era. So that's going to become more important as we go along. Instead of having, um, instead of having a sort of emotional outburst, say that in the same way that the romantic composers are going to do, what we're going to see is some rhetorical styles that, that composers are going to draw from to help them compose. And this was at the end of the chapter and talking about the um, Greek topoi. So I just want to go through a few of these and, and, and get them in your ear before we, 
before we go on. Um, Seton identifies essentially six of these. You have a military style, a singing style, a pastoral style, the dance style, the brilliant style, and then the impassioned style, which is um, related to that is related to CPE Bach. Um, so let me go through and kind of give you some examples. Whenever I was in grad school, my teacher would ask me, um, is the piece I'm playing a song, a dance, or a march? Okay, now that's only three of them, but most of the songs are going to fall into one of those three categories. But we have six different uh, primary styles, and you, if you were to go through and categorize almost any classical piece of music, you would find that most of them fall into one of those uh, theme groups when they're, when they're being composed. So the first one would be a military, um, a military topoi or uh, a military rhetoric. And this is a, a way of just establishing your, your key. It's very grand, very noble. Um, so Mozart would do something like this. direct, very octave-oriented, octave sounds like horns being imitated. Haydn would do something like this. So it sounds like very much like a military march, something very regal. Um, with Beethoven, you're going to get um, that throughout his music, you're going to hear in a lot in his symphonies. We also have the singing or cantabile style, which is one of uh, my favorites. So you've got this piece, lovely piece by Beethoven. Or Schubert. imitating an opera singer on this particular style so it sounds like an aria. We have the pastoral which is related to shepherds and, and idyllic settings so you'll hear some of those. Beethoven actually wrote a pastoral symphony and here's his pastoral sonata. So very calm, warm, a lot of times it will invoke the flute sounds and higher registers, so it sounds like a shepherd boy watching over his sheep. The fourth one that you're going to hear quite a bit is the dance, and Seton gives you a long list of all the types of dances that you're going to see, but um, if you're thinking about this, you're going to hear a lot of the dances in the, in the symphonies we'll listen to. So here's one from a Schubert sonata. So it's not written as a dance, it's not meant to be danced, but it essentially is a dance. We have the fifth one, which is the brilliant style, which is flashy, fast, flamboyant, so it's all over the place. Beethoven loves it. Lots of 16th notes, lots of big flashy um, figure, figures. And then the last one is the more impassioned, emotionally um, charged type of piece. It could be slow, it could be fast. Um, if you were able to come to my recital a few months ago, I played this piece by Clementi, a classical composer.
So you have that deeply emotionally charged music, which is related to CPE Bach, the Infantsheimer style, um, a German term there, from the mid, uh, mid 18th century. So um, those are the six styles. And as we get into sonatas and rondos, especially tomorrow in recitation, you'll notice the different styles and how composers will combine several of those together. Um, so one of the other things we talked about last week is Karl Barth and his relationship with, to Mozart. So if you recall, Karl, Karl Barth was one of the most important and prolific uh, Protestant theologians of the 20th century. And he has an obsession with Mozart. He loved him. He thought he, that his music was superior essentially to everyone else. Um, and he talks about the way that his music demonstrates simplicity, joy, and otherness in a way that is um, reflective of God's creation. Over the weekend, I was reading through his book called Mozart, and one of his, one of his statements is, Mozart does not will to proclaim the praise of God. He just does it, precisely in that humility in which he himself, so to speak, is the only instrument with which he allows us to hear what he hears, what surges at him from God's creation, what rises in him, and what must proceed in him. So this idea that Mozart's music is essentially a parable of creation. And as we talked about last week, so many of the values of classicism fit really nicely in with um, the biblical idea of creation. So the idea that there is order in this world, that we have not only time, which God puts in weeks, which we put in months and then into years, but we also have um, order of, of ideas. So when we, have, um, when we have musical ideas, we put them in an order that makes sense, from which they move logically from right to left. The same thing is true in relationships. So we have male relationships and female relationships, and those function in different ways. They're um, equal in personhood, but, but not equal in... Uh, function. The same thing is true in the Trinity, right? So there's a higher hierarchy and a different role for um, the the three the three persons of the Trinity. So this idea of order and these idea of of, of, of simplicity, everything is is straightforward. Even a child can understand it. These are um, these are parallel very nicely with the biblical related order. And then um, Bart also talks about the, the problem of subjectivity, which is something that um, romantics are really into, and Beethoven really moves in that direction, which we'll talk about next week. But uh, Bart writes, Mozart's Requiem is not his personal confession, and neither is the magic flute, which is the opera we looked at a little bit. The subjective is never his theme. He never used music to express himself, his situation, his moods. I do not know of a single instance where one can, with any certainty, explain the character of a work from a corresponding episode in his life, so that from the succession of his works one might trace something like a biographical line. Mozart's life serves as art, not the other way around. So this is how Bart is explaining the objectivity in Mozart's music. It's not based on his life and his experience or what he's feeling that day, but it's based on a um, well-crafted um, process of composition that uses those rhetorical devices that I mentioned and communicates well and is full of emotion, but not some sort of subjective um, emotion based on how his what kind of hair day he's having. So, so that's where we are at this point. And we are going to move from opera, which we did last week, to instrumental music today. And so we're going to talk about um, 
three overarching ideas. The first is that we're going to look at the genres. So these are the types of pieces that share a certain, certain convention. So symphonies, sonatas, string quartets. We're going to look at some of the formal procedures as well. And um, we're going to spend more time on that tomorrow in recitation. And the reason we're going to make a big deal about this is for the rest of your life, I would like for you to be able to hear music structurally. So that when you go to a concert, you're not wondering, what are they doing? What's going on? It's just pretty music and it's going over my head. Um, instead, I'd like for you to learn how to listen to different themes, how they relate to one another, and how they're developed. And if you can do that, then you can really appreciate um, classical music. And then um, at the end of the lecture, we'll talk a little bit more about um, Haydn and Mozart. So I just want to give you that sort of overview as we go through. All right, so I'm going to put a PowerPoint up here for you. All right, so here are values of classicism. And so um, now what we're going to start with are the are the different genres that, that Seton talks about. The first one is the classical symphony. And the symphony develops during the, uh, during the Baroque era. So what we have is called a symphonia, and that would be an instrumental work that precedes each act of an opera. So uh, sometimes you'd have all the symphonia parts of the symphonies at the beginning of the opera, but usually uh, at the beginning of every act you would have a symphonia. And so um, what, what happened is composers started extracting that symphonia from the opera and you would get a, um, a, a four movement word. So it started out as three with fast, slow, fast. But now we've got a four movement work, okay? So the first, um, the first movement is going to be typically the most serious in its demeanor. It's usually going to be the longest in scope as well. And that movement will use sonata form, which we will, um, again, talk about in a few moments. So that's the one that you often know. So if you're listening to Beethoven Fifth, the theme that you all think about is the first movement. Right, that's the first movement, that's what you, your ear automatically goes to. The second movement is usually very slow and it's very much like an aria. Okay, so it's imitating a singer, cantabile form, um, using that, that second that second rhetorical device that we talked about. We have um, the minuet and trio. So the minuet, of course, is a very popular Baroque dance. So what you would have is a dance followed by a contrasting dance, and then you repeat the first dance. So you'd have minuet one, either minuet two or, or a trio, followed by a repeat of that first minuet. So, and then the, the fourth movement, there's some flexibility there. Um, usually it's very fast, very light, often in sonata form, but sometimes in rondo form, and very brilliant so that you leave the symphony on a high note. So, those can look very differently depending on the composer, but that's the, that's the general structure of the symphony. So what is the symphony, put, how is it put together? So you can see here, this is the seating arrangement of a classical symphony. So going from left to right, 
We've got the violin one closest to the audience, then violin two. Then right in front of the conductor would be the violas. And then on the right side of the conductor, you'd have the cellos followed by the double basses. So those would be your strings. And then straight back in the middle, you're going to have the winds, which started out as flute, oboe, and bassoon. And then in the back row, as far back from um, as possible, we have the timpani, which would later increase in percussion. And then we have the French horns. And then when, when the composer used the trumpet, we would have the trumpets seated next to the French horns. So this is the traditional seating arrangement. And you can see this in the score of Haydn. This is one of his early uh, symphonies. You've got the flute. This one uses two oboes, perhaps because he had to. Um, we've got the bassoon. Then you've got the horns in D. We don't have any trumpets or timpani, but then you have the sections in the strings. So the violin one, violin two, viola, cello, and bass. This is a Mozart symphony. This is the Jupiter, one of his, um, one of his later ones. And you'll see this has a much larger um, a score. So you've got flutes, oboes, Bugatti is uh, bassoon, you have corny and C, which is horns, tromba is trumpet, and then you have the timpani and the strings. So that's a more expansive classical, expansive classical um, symphony. And then we'll, by the time we get to Beethoven, we've added a clarinet and um, the number of, of strings of, of actual violin players is much, much larger. So you can see the textures getting larger the further in we go. So we're going to come back to these in just a second here. But that's the seating. Those are the instruments that we have in our symphony. And these are the, our composers. So Haydn is the really the most important. He's kind of the father of the symphony. He wrote 106 symphonies. Most of these were for the Esterhazy family, but we also have several wonderful sets from his travels to Paris and London. So the London symphonies are really extraordinary. Those are kind of his masterpieces um, from the 1790s. With Mozart, we have 41 numbered symphonies, so scholars have numbered 41 of them, but there's 68 total that, that fall within this genre. With Beethoven, we have nine. So it seems like Beethoven's getting slack, but what Beethoven is actually doing is expanding the symphony to a much more massive form. So with Haydn symphonies, they might be 20 minutes long. With Beethoven, you're pushing close to an hour on some of those pieces. And then Schubert, who sometimes gets left out of these discussions, wrote seven symphonies and one incomplete symphony which is titled The Unfinished, and The Unfinished is the one that we often listen to the most. So um, I'm going to take a risk here and, and play some excerpts for, um, for you to hear. I've had a little bit of sound concerns this morning, so I'm gonna, we're just going to pray it all works out here. All right, so what I'd like for you to do is just listen to some excerpts from Haydn's Symphony in D major, the Le Matin, which is the morning, and just get a sense of what that sounds like.
So for that particular symphony, you hear the introduction and then we get into the, the faster part. A lot of times the first movements would have a slow introduction and then you'd get right into the, um, into the faster allegro section. So let's look at Mozart's symphony number uh, 41, which is Jupiter. You'll notice a different approach to instrumentation immediately. La Matin, Haydn's symphony that we just listened to, is very string-based, heavy on the strings, and this one is more equal among the instruments. Here, transitioning to a second theme. So if you're listening carefully, what you heard is sort of a military opening, sort of a very noble opening, followed by then a, a more cantabile second um, theme area. So that's traditional, and we're going to talk about that in just a second in more detail. Now let's listen to Beethoven. So this Mozart, this is late, late Mozart that we just listened to sort of toward the end of his life. And then we're going to listen to Beethoven, which is from um, 1811, 1812. This is the symphony number no. seven. So about 20 years later. This is Leonard Bernstein, a great American conductor.
So I better stop that now. It's one of my favorite pieces. So I'd be happy to let you hear the whole thing, but then we wouldn't get anything else done. Um, it's an incredible piece of music. So let me switch back to PowerPoint here. All right, so those are the symphonies, and what you heard, hopefully, was a, a sort of a baby symphony, early, early stage symphony, lots of strings, and then by the end, you're getting this really integrated, beautiful, huge sound that in, in, um, is using all the instruments a little bit more equitably with Beethoven. The symphony continues to build in number, so by the time we get to the end of the Romantic era, the symphony is... Is, is really quite large. So that is the symphony. Just wanted to show you this is um, an early manuscript of Beethoven's seventh. So that's what it would have looked like um, when it was published early on. Sorry, this is not a manuscript. This is the, one of the early editions. And then this is the modern edition of that. So lots of notes there, a very full and rich texture. So uh, this, this PowerPoint is, of course, on Populi, so you can go back and listen to those and, and find those exact recordings that I used. All right, so uh, the second form that we're going to be looking at is the string quartet. And Haydn is also considered the father of the string quartet. And the reason is he's the earliest of the classical, the great classical composers. And he's writing a lot of music for, um, for different events at Esterhazy. So a small ensemble of four people works nicely. So what happens is one of the primary um, forms in the Baroque era is called a trio sonata. A trio sonata of course is for four players not for three. You have the the two treble instruments and then the uh, third part would be like a bassoon or a cello and a keyboard player. They would be playing the basso continuo. So you'd have actually four players playing a trio sonata, um, and the trio meaning essentially three parts. So the string quartet really comes out of that, and what Haydn does is more equalizes the parts a bit so that you can, um, you don't have just violin with cello accompaniment and viola accompaniment. You have more and more of, a, of, of an equalized texture so that each one of those four instruments is uh, important in its own right. So the string quartet follows the same exact plan as the symphony. So you'd have a fast movement an allegro sonata allegro form at the beginning. Then you would usually have a slow movement in an aria form followed by a dance and then a fast, a fast movement. So uh, this is one of the uh, experimental genres that composers would use to develop their craft. So it would it would be a way of learning how to write for um, for the stringed instruments in such a way where you've got the equality of the parts going on. You've got to use different timbres. You really have to master the form and work with expectations because that's how the audience figures out what's going on is knowing what to expect and delaying those expectations and whatnot. So for your listening this week, one of the pieces is the joke string quartet of Haydn. And what Haydn does is when he's playing with those conventions, he delays them and uh, tricks the audience so that he's basically playing a joke on them. So at the end, you think the piece is over and you start to clap and then it keeps going and then you start to clap again, and by the, by the third time, you're like, I'm just not going to clap because I don't know when the piece is over. So that's 
um, one of the ways that Haydn would, would explore um, the ways that you can use sonata form in his pieces. So I'd encourage you to listen to those and uh, get a sense for, for the string quartet as well. You can see here Haydn wrote quite a few. He was really the master of the string quartet. So there's 68 of those. Mozart wrote 23. Beethoven wrote 16. And Schubert wrote 15. Um, so again, as I said, Haydn is the really the greatest. He's the father of the, of the form. So Mozart and Beethoven really learned from him. Um, Beethoven was very, very self-conscious about writing string quartets. He wrote an early set, Opus 18, but really didn't want to come back to it for a long time because he just wanted to make sure that he understood it well enough to take it to the next level, which he was apt to do. So his late string quartets are some of the most sophisticated pieces of music from, from all time. They're extraordinary pieces. So this is a really important genre. It's going to continue through the Romantic era into today's time. So, so those are the those are the composers, and um, that is the second form. All right, now we get to the keyboard sonata, which, if you know me, I'm a pianist, and this is where I'm super happy. Um, so the keyboard sonata develops during this time as well. Most of the composers that we're talking about were also virtuoso pianists, and so they would write these keyboard sonatas to showcase their, um, their skills and their talents, but it was also a bit of a laboratory for them to develop sonata form and to develop their structural understanding of how music worked. So um, it follows again, just like the string quartet, it has the same plan as the symphony. So you have um, a first movement in sonata form, second movement's usually an aria, followed by minuet and trio, which will later become like a scherzo, just a really fast showpiece, and then the fast finale, which can be in sonata or um, rondo form. So it was during this period that we stopped using the harpsichord so much. The piano is invented in 1706, but it's not really developed um, into a usable instrument until the mid-century. Mid and then it's called a forte piano. So we have um, composers who are able to play quietly and softly on the same instrument. That's something that, that a... Um, harpsichord could not do. So you are thus able to have con contrasting styles. So if you can play in loud and soft on the same instrument, that allows you to play with this um, sonata principle, the idea of contrasting um, in a way that you couldn't do on the harpsichord. So the, the keyboard sonata is really quite important. Now you know, the one that everybody knows is probably not the one that's the best example, which is the Moonlight Sonata. So that's not really the best example, but it is certainly the most popular, right? So Beethoven wrote 32 of these. They're all masterpieces, all 32 of them. Uh, Haydn wrote about 62. We have 52 that are extant. Um, there was a fire at Esterhazy, and so a lot of his music was lost in that fire. So we don't really know exactly how many he has. Mozart wrote 18, um, and then Schubert 23. So these are really wonderful pieces. I'm just going to give you a little bit of an ex example of what it would look like with Haydn. So you would start out with a, a masculine theme.
Okay, and that would be your opening theme. Very masculine, very robust. And then what he would do is change from, um, in this particular case, from minor to the, um, to the median, which is going from one to three. And so his second theme is much more cheerful and uh, graceful. that contrast again both in style rhetorical style as well as key areas and so then this particular one Haydn skips the slow quiet movement um, and goes straight to the dances So these are, these are minuets. So Haydn is typically uh, writing in three movements, just fast, slow, fast, as opposed to Mozart and Beethoven, which usually have all four. And then you get to his final movement, which is um, also sonata form. Based on uh, sonata form again, just like just like the first movement. So they're using the the piano sonata as a, a genre to develop this this process of understanding how to write sonatas. So I want to talk about the last um, the last two that he mentions. Um, I'm not going to give a whole lot of time to those, but. Um, the other, the other two important ones that use sonata principle are the instrumental concerto. Um, this is based on the concertato principle in the Baroque period that we talked about, where you have orchestra and soloists going back and forth. So um, in, the, in the classical period, we're going to integrate them. So the soloist is more um, has a major role in the form of the piece rather than just showing off his skill. There's, there's that element as well, but there's also the sense of um, the, the soloist is an important part of developing the form. So you probably know that's one of Mozart's more famous ones. Um, Elvira Madigan is a um, another famous one that you probably have heard as well. There are concertos for clarinet, for horns, for trumpets. Um, Haydn has a fantastic trumpet concerto. There are a lot of violin and piano sonatas, especially in Beethoven. Um, so uh, we even have cello. If you were able to hear Dr. Tutino's um, faculty recital, we gave a, a, a cello and piano sonata. So which is similar, similar idea to the concerto. Um, so that's the, that's the concerto. Mozart wrote 27 masterpieces in that form for, for piano concerto. And then we also have the divertimento, which is worth mis mentioning because one of the things that classical composers were doing was writing music for entertainment and for courts and for that sort of thing. So you would have um, a court a party out, outdoors or something, and so the composer would be tasked with uh, putting together some sort of entertainment. So you get pieces like this. <laughs> Ein Klein and Nacht music of, of Mozart. So you get this, this lighter, lighter music that still uses sonata principle, but it's um, more for uh, for our enjoyment rather than for our edification, so to speak. All right, so those are the four, um, those are the four areas, or sorry, five areas that we, that we need to talk about. 
So let me um, let me talk about uh, this for just a second. Um, a couple of questions here. Does it usually go from a more military style to a singing style? So what usually happens is you would go from a masculine style to a more feminine style. Uh, so it wouldn't necessarily be more military, but we do think in terms of balancing. So if you have something masculine, you're going to follow it with something feminine. Later on, they might start with something feminine and go to something masculine. But this is one example of where balance comes into play during this period. So if you say something masculine, you have to, you have to answer it with something feminine. You can't have two masculine themes, really. Uh, that doesn't fit within those aesthetics, and it certainly doesn't um, work with the idea of balance. All right, so um, what we're going to do now is just turn our attention to what sonata form is. I've been talking a lot about it, and you read it, and it probably looked like a calculus textbook, but um, it's not really all that it's not really all that tricky. So I'm going to use um, the board. So with the sonata principle. What we're dealing with is how we interact with different themes. So, we're going to start with what's called the exposition. I'll write that bigger there. Um, Flannery O'Connor says, right in big big bold strokes so everyone can see. So, so we have the exposition. And in the exposition, what's going to happen is we're going to introduce our themes. Okay? So expose. So we're, we're going to have a principal theme. And we're going to follow that with a transition. And what's going to happen is that transition is going to take us from the tonic. Okay, that's our home key, right? And we're going to transition that usually to the dominant. Okay, so every key has one dominant. And that is the, the, that's the chord that has the most tension that leads you back to the tonic. So our theme area is going to move to the dominant. If it's a minor key, usually it would go to the median, but if it's major, we usually go to the dominant. So we're going to have a second principal theme. And then once we have stated that second theme, then we're going to have a, look, a very, usually a very short closing theme. Okay, the the closing theme is not is not the most identical or the most charming. It's just something to bring the the movement to an end and conclude it. Okay, so what happens is you get we'll have a double bar line. You have theme one transition. Principal theme two, and then it'll transition to a closing theme. And then that's repeated. Okay? So we start out in tonic. We move to the dominant, and then you repeat it, and it goes back to the tonic. So that's our first section, okay? And again, like I said, this is going to be usually a masculine theme followed by a feminine theme. It could change back and forth depending on the time um, 
as we get further in, close to the romantic, romantic period. But that's your first section. Okay, so let me just read a few um, remarks from Copeland. You're going to read this, and we're going to talk about this tomorrow. You see, the sonata form, properly understood, is essentially a psychological and dramatic form. You cannot very well mix two or more elements of the exposition without creating a sense of struggle or drama. Okay? It is the development section that challenges the imagination of every composer, which we'll talk about next. One might go so far as to say that one of the main things that separates the composer from the layman. Anyone can whistle tunes, but you have to be a composer with the composer's craft and technique in order to be able to write a really fine development of those tunes. Okay, so what you're going to do is use this struggle between the tonic and the dominant as your, as your sort of your guiding point, and that's where all the drama comes. And so then we get to the second major section. So the first section is our expo, and then we get to the development. And the development section is different for every single composer. There's no form for this, no formula. The idea is you're going to take those principal themes and you're going to use them to, um, to create a section of, of, of great instability. Okay, So we have no idea where we're going. Harmonically, you could do anything you want to, really. Okay, But the idea is you're taking the exposition and using those with motives, with transposition, with all sorts of things to create this sense of drama and this sense of distance and this sense of a struggle. Okay? So the struggle then is finally resolved so that you get back to what's called the recapitulation or the recap. Okay? So you recap what you had in the exposition. Okay, so you restate it. There's one really important difference. Okay, okay, so we get back to tonic for the principal theme one. Okay, so we're, we're back in the home key that we started in. But then, through the transition, it has to be changed because the principal theme two is also in tonic. And we don't modulate again. So we've come back and we've developed our second theme such that it stays in the tonic area. So one of the things that, um, that you probably know about me is I love Jeremy Begbie, and he's very influential on the way I think about music. And one of, the, one of his analogies is using the sonata form as a metaphor for the Christian life. Um, and you've seen this before with Bonhoeffer when we talked about the art of you, the cantus firmus is the love of God and all that counterpoint are the things of this world that can distract us and get us off kilter. But as long as that canis firmus is there, then we have stability and, and, and meaning and purpose. So, and then we get to Karl Barth, who uses Mozart as an example for God's good creation. So with Begbie, the way he's thinking about sonata form is a metaphor really for the Christian life as well which starts here on earth. So our exposition is our earthly home. We started in tonic, but then with that transition, sin is entered into the world. And so our, our home changes. It becomes the, the dominant area. 
That's not our true home. So then development, every development is different, right? So life is different for all of us. All of our struggles are different. All of the things that happen to us, the challenges of life, those things are, are different for everybody, just as they are in every single sonata. But then when you get to the recapitulation, it's this beautiful image of, of, of getting back home. So you get back home to your tonic key. And then we move on from our earthly home to our heavenly home where there is no sin. And so by the time we get to the second theme of, this, of the recapitulation, we are in our, earthly, our heavenly home, which is our tonic. And that is more of a home than we ever had before on earth. So it's more home than, than our original home. And so it's a really beautiful picture. If you're interested in following up on that analogy, I can give you some resources where Begbie talks about that. But it's a really fantastic way of thinking about this form as a metaphor for the Christian life. So um, Meredith uh, asked after theme two is what again? So after theme two is essentially the closing. It just it brings the section to a close. It's called the closing theme. It's usually, you know, eight, eight to 16 bars at the most, sometimes not even that much. So let me show you how it works. I'm just going to go back to this Haydn Sonata that, um, that I played for you earlier. So here's your principal theme. So what will happen is you'll cadence off in, in your home key. Okay, so that's, that's the end of theme one. And then he's going to start it again, so you think. And so that's your transition. So you've transitioned now using the opening material to get to a new section, okay? So you've modulated, in this particular case, from one, and we're now moving to three. Okay, so then we got our second section. We go through that section and then it wraps up with lots and lots of scales and then you get a little closing. Okay, and so that's the end of your exposition. You've ended in a different key than you started with. So then we go to the development and he's going to be going all over the place, right? But you're going to hear themes that you recognize. And then we're all over the place. Who has any idea where we're going to go? And then you get these, this little um, retransition back home okay so then we're, we're now in the recap we're playing the same theme in the original key just as it was before but what happens is we don't modulate. We're still in our home key. Sorry. OK, 
Okay, so what happens is we stay in the same key. The piece is, is tightened up a little bit, so you didn't need a transition, so he cut it out completely. So we've stayed in our key, and then the closing theme is also remains in our tonic key. So that's the image of, and that's the idea about how the sonata form works. And um, what I wanted to talk about a little bit is um, two of the most important composers of this period, um, Mozart and Haydn. But specifically, uh, just a few words about Haydn. Um, we talked about Mozart a good bit last week, so I'm going to try to try to just focus in on. What are some aspects of Haydn's life and career that are, that are worth noting? Um, the first thing I wanted to, to read to you from is a section on Haydn's contract with his patron, Prince Esterhazy. So Haydn's career was built around this gentleman, Prince Esterhazy, who provided for him a home, provided work for him. He had musicians and gave him gave him a fair amount of um, flexibility for Haydn to really blossom as a composer. But I think we also get a sense of um, of, of how Esterhazy and, and Faith work out in some of Haydn's work. One of Haydn's great contributions to um, to classical music is creation, which is a orator an oratorio based on Milton's Paradise Lost and passages from Genesis 1 and 2 as well as a few of the Psalms. So we get some sort of Christian influence in the way that some of these documents read. So this is this is Haydn's uh, contract with the Esterhazys and I just want you to think about how this mirrors the language of, of the Gospel. The said Joseph Haydn shall be considered and treated as a member of the household. Therefore, His Serene Highness is graciously pleased to place confidence in him conducting himself as becomes an honorable official of a princely house. He must be temperate, not showing himself overbearing toward his musicians, but mild and lenient, straightforward and composed. It is especially to be observed that when the orchestra shall be summoned to perform before company, the uh, vice Kapellmeister, which was Haydn's title, and all the mu musicians shall appear in uniform, and the said Joseph Haydn shall take care that he and all the members of his orchestra follow the instructions given and appear in white, so white stockings, white linen, powdered, and with either a pigtail or a tie wig. So, one of the things that really strikes me about the way that Esther Hazy has prepared this contract is the way that it mimics um, the gospel. So my, my former pastor was a man named Sinclair Ferguson, and he writes, In our language today, we speak of the indicative mood and the imperative mood. The indicative mood is saying, these are things that are true. The imperative mood is saying, these things are you need to do. And in the gospel, the structure of the grammar is always indicative gives rise to the imperative. So this particular paragraph that I read for you is a really wonderful example of how that works. It begins with, Haydn shall be considered and treated as a member of the household, which is a high, high calling for him. And then, the Serene Highness Prince Esterhazy is graciously pleased to place confidence in him conducting himself as an honorable official. And then he fleshes that out. So it very much mimics something that the Apostle Paul would have written in one of his letters, where, for example, in Ephesians, you spend three chapters talking about what it means to be in Christ. What are your privileges? What has God called you to? 
these things are true apart from anything that you do. And then starting with chapter 4 in Ephesians, you have this therefore, and it gives you three chapters of this is what it looks like for you to live in light of that calling. So this is a really wonderful image of what gospel life looks like and how that can be incorporated into one's job. I also want to talk to you a l- and talk about Haydn's reception later as he goes to London. There's some really interesting things here that I think are worth noting. So um, Haydn was a, very much a celebrity. It's hard for us to think about a classical music celebrity in our day. Mostly we think about Taylor Swift or Adele or whoever you want to fill in the blank with. And we don't actually think the classical composers are really all that, all that much of a celebrity. But in Haydn's day, this would be true. So there were all kind of things written after his trip to London, his tour of London. Um, and this one, uh, this one author actually wrote an extended poem about Haydn's trip to London. I'm just going to read some parts of this so you get a sense of how, how his, he was received. Haydn, great sovereign of the tuneful art, thy works alone supply an ample chart of all the mountain seas and fertile plains within the compass of its wide domains. Is there an artist of the present day untaught by thee to think as well as play, whose hand thy science has not well supplied, whose hand thy labors have not fortified? Thy style has gained disciples, converts, friends, as far as music's thrilling power extends. Nor has great Newton more to satisfaction demonstrated the influence of attraction. And though, and though to Italy of right belong the undisputed sovereignty of song, yet every nation of the earth must now to Germany preeminence allow for instrumental powers, unknown before thy happy flights had taught her sons to soar. So there's a lot going on here. So I doubt you've read this in your literature class, although it would be great fun. Um, a couple of things. One is you get that theme of Haydn's influence over the other composers. Uh, Mozart and Beethoven looked up to Haydn. He was a master of the art. So everyone who was composing at that time was looking to Haydn for inspiration and to learn how to write the craft because he had spent he had spent so long working it out. So at this point, over 30, between 30 and 40 years, he had been a composer. The next thing I want you to notice is the way they talk about music. So he says, whose hand thy science has not well supplied. So this is a common theme in the way that critics would talk about music during this period. There's, a, um, there's several different places. He says later, where skill for each fantastic whim provides in certain science, every current uh, guides. So um, I've got several other examples here where it says, also says about, talks about music as a science. So for the classical composer, they were thinking about it very much in enlightenment terms, which uh, is as a science. There is, it's not just an art, but there is a science to it that Haydn has really mastered. There are things that are right and there are things that are wrong. There's an empiricism about it and a rationality behind the composing that we haven't really seen before, and certainly not in the language. And then um, one, one other thing to, to note is he talks about Italy being the uh, an indisputed sovereignty of song. And that's because if Italians conceived of the idea of opera. And opera is all about singing. It's about um, making music. And so we have that sense of 
song coming from them, but for the next hundred years, and maybe even more, depending on who you ask, the writer says, Yet every nation of the earth must now to Germany preeminence allow. So this is with Haydn. This is before Beethoven has made any sense of splash. Okay, So Haydn has really put Germany on the map as the place from which we can think about um, instrumental music coming from. So um, for the next hundred years, we're going to see Germany at really the center of that, with, certainly with Beethoven, and then with Brahms and a lot of his other, um, a lot of other colleagues. And then the final thing I'm, I'd like to read is a prose uh, response to Haydn's performance that has some of these same themes. It is not wonderful that to souls capable of being touched by music, Haydn should be an object of homage and even of idolatry. For like our own Shakespeare, he moves and governs the passions at will. Sounds very, um, very much like a Baroque critic, right? His new grand overture, which is what they call a symphony, was pr pronounced by every scientific ear. So again, that idea, the Enlightenment idea of a scientific ear, to be a most wonderful composition. But the first movement in particular rises in grandeur of subject and in the rich variety of air and passion, beyond any, even of his own productions. The overture has four movements, an allegro, andante, minuet, and a rondo. They are all beautiful, but the first is preeminent in every charm, which is what I was mentioning at the beginning of our discussion, like the first, the first movement of a, of a symphony and of a sonata is the more important one structurally. It's the one that really establishes the, uh, the, the weight of that particular sonata. We are happy to see the concert so well attended the first night, for we cannot suppress our very ancient hopes that the first musical genius of the age, so Haydn is the first musical genius of the age, may be induced by our liberal welcome to take his residence in England. So he, he made such a, a, such a huge impact on the English that they really wanted him to move there. So from this time we get his London symphonies, which are um, 12 of the, some of the finest symphonies that we, that we have. We have his mature piano sonatas, the variations in F minor, and then Creation, which is a real extraordinary um, work of working out of his faith and of the idea that God actually created the world, which is against what, what the traditional Enlightenment thinker would, would have probably thought of. So um, it's, a real, it's a real affirmation of faith. So this is Haydn, and I wanted to, um, as we finish up, we've got about five minutes, and if you have any questions that you'd like to follow up on, um, this would be a good time just to type those in the chat button or or you can even ask them um, with your microphone. So Nathan is how how is the notion of indicative and in giving rise to the imperative expressed in a sonata? It's not so much in the sonata form as it was. I was using the example of Haydn's um, contract to give us an example of how that indicative. Is developed so more uh, more in how the um, the structure of his relationship with Esther Hazy revealed some biblical truth. So that was that was more of what we were talking about there. In terms of the sonata, we're thinking about the sonata as a metaphor for the Christian life. Um, this is not how they would have thought about it, but Begbie is using it sort of in retrospect as a model for thinking about what what Christian life looks like. So So uh, Elizabeth has a great question. Was Haydn's surprise symphony another thing like the joke string quartet? So you probably know this
So, um, the legend is that Haydn noticed that some of the members of the audience were falling asleep. So he was conducting this particular this particular piece, and again, according to legend, I'm not sure if this is true or not, but he had not written a forte on that big chord that I just played. It was just a functional chord to get us from tonic to dominant. Well, what he did was he got the attention of the audience, and as he was conducting it, he's like, watch me. And he gave them a huge gesture, and so they played it really loud. And what happened was the audience members jumped out of their seats because they had almost fallen asleep. So it was a way of just keeping them awake and um, keeping them engaged in the piece. So he was playing a joke on the audience um, from, from, what I'm, from what I'm aware. So I don't know if that's, I don't know how embellished that story is, but um, that's, the, that's the idea of the, of the surprise symphony. Um, and Ella says, I remembered my teacher telling me about this lady who yelled in a symphony because she was surprised by something like that. So yeah, that, that was, um, that's certainly alarming if, if you're not expecting it. Um, so Cheyenne writes, so is each movement in a symphony structured with the sonata principle? Uh, not necessarily, but sometimes. Almost 100% of the time, the first movement is and more than 50% the last movement is, but the middle movement, the, uh, this, the aria-like, the second slow one is usually not, and the minuet and trio is almost never a sonata. So it's usually the first, sometimes the fourth, but rarely the middle two. Um, so let me go back to the styles. These are all straight out of your book. So if you missed them, they're, they're at the end of the chapter. Um, so the first one I talked about was military. The second one is the singing style. The third is the pastoral, which again is imitating um, sheep, shepherds, that sort of idyllic scene. The fourth one is dance. Um, the fifth one is the brilliant style with a lot of sixteenth notes. And the last one is the impassioned is what uh, Seton calls the impassioned one. It's related to one of the German literary movements of that day. So we'll just call it impassioned. But those are the six. Um, what did Haydn think of being such a celebrity? Well, I think he really enjoyed it. I think he liked the attention. He had spent his entire career living on a basically an estate and working exclusively for this one man. And so now to have all this um, acclamation from outside of that area was really, I think, rewarding for him because he had, he had had to do so much on his own. He didn't have a community to, to work with, and he didn't have a really strong teacher. So um, anyway, those are some of the things that we, that we, um, that we know about Haydn. He's got letters that you can read and, and get a better sense of that. Yes, the poem was certainly high pressure, and it was it was indicative of his fame there. Um, yeah, I'll talk about the final later, Rebecca. But um, I will also send you a quick email. Your questions are due today, so there's a there's a folder that I'd like for you to submit those in, so I don't get forty something emails today. So that's on Populi. So if you would just upload that. Upload that question into Populi on the uh, Google Drive that, that I'm giving you there. And um, I'll be around if you need to ask any other questions. So I hope you've enjoyed the lecture today. Again, to our, to our guests.
thanks for coming in, and I hope you've also um, enjoyed our time together. Have a great day. Enjoy the unexpected snow, and I'll see you at recitation.